Those are Dr. Albert Theodore Dura, a very, pro a very prominent surgeon and professor in Germany, and he made this statement. He said, a surgeon who dares to suture a heart deserves to lose the esteem of his medical brethren. So here's one of the best surgeons in the world at that time. It was just 1883. And then what happened was in 1891, a doctor in St. Louis, Dr. Dalton, actually did dare to suture the heart. Now he really didn't suture the heart. He sutured the sac around the heart. After that, in 1891, there was another prominent doctor, prominent because of what he did. He also operated on the heart. And there was Daniel Hannah Williams, and he was an African-American doctor here in Chicago who did that at Providence Hospital on the south side. And then in 1893, there was a doctor in, in Frankfurt, Germany, who actually operated on the myocardium, which is the actual heart itself. So from 1893 till today, it's a very short period of medical development, but look where we're at. Our nephew, or my nephew, Tino's son, Tony, was going to be here this afternoon, but he is in Nice, France, giving a lecture on heart-lung transplants. Not only the heart, but the heart and the lung being done together. Amazing where we've come. And uh, I just want to just tell you another little story that uh, when people talk about the heart, they say, I've got heartfelt feelings for somebody. I've got heart palpitation when I see somebody. You know, you, you, you drive my heart crazy or whatever you want. Nobody has ever said, you've driven my liver crazy. So, <laughs> so uh, without ado, what I'd like to do is introduce my brother, Dr. Dino Tatoulis, and then he'll take it from there. speak to patients and many doctors don't know how to do this you know they're, they're really uh, stand at the foot of the bed and they spend a little bit of time with the patient but one of my professors was really great Dr. Adams at the University of Chicago and when we would make rounds he would go and take a chair next to the patient's bed and he'd sit there and talk to the patient and then he'd leave. Now the patient thought he was there all afternoon because he was sitting down talking to the patient. And he had such a bed bedside manner, it was great. But some people don't have a very good bedside manner. Like this person I heard the other day, his girlfriend was going on a business trip and she had a cat. And she asked her boyfriend, can you watch my cat for me while I'm on this business trip? And uh, he said, of course I can. So about three days later, she calls him back and she says, uh, how's the cat doing? He said, the cat died. Oh my God, you can't say the cat died. That's not the way to go ahead and talk about it. You should say, the cat was on the roof. You call the fire department. They tried to rescue the cat. The cat fell down, landed on the ground, went into the intensive care unit in the hospital. And that would be a better way to say it. And then she said, by the way, how's my mother? He said, she's under roof. <laughs> <laughs> Anyhow, the thing that is really interesting is that the individuals that you have an opportunity to meet is really spectacular because every one of them that I've met have been really aggressive. And they had a lot of confidence in what they were doing. And you have to have confidence to try to do something new because nobody was really operating on hearts at the time. And nobody was doing very much for the heart at the time. And we had a number of different kinds of professors that were really, really interesting and very influential for me. For instance, when I was a resident at the University of Chicago, Dr. George Black, who Dr. Dietrich knows, 
was at the University of Michigan, came over to be professor of general surgery there. And this guy was phenomenal. He was the only heir to the Holman Matheson fortune, Holman aluminum, Holman chemicals, good pharmaceuticals. And this guy would donate his salary plus $20 million a year to the university. But he was a real tough guy. And I remember in those days, there was an open parking lot in the back of the hospital. And it said parking 50 cents all day. So Dr. Block goes back there, parks his car, he had to do some business downtown. He comes back and he pulls back into the parking lot. And the attendant said, where are you going? He said, I'm come, coming back. He says, 50 cents all day. I'm not going to pay another 50 cents. He said, no, no, you got to pay again. So Dr. Bach hit him, knocked him down. <laughs> so the administrator of the hospital said, Dr. Bach, you got to be a little bit more patient with our employees. But that's the way he was. He just expressed himself unbelievably. For instance, he was really one of my strong mentors. That when we were doing an operation in the operating room, the patient was a short Pain patient, and we were doing adrenalectomies, which is a gland in the back of the of the of the, of the chest, of the abdomen, and they were doing them for patients that had cancer of the lung, the cancer of any type, and it was more or less experimental. So Dr. Block said, "Okay, you know, you go ahead and you operate on this patient." So I put the X-ray on the view box, and it was a short little lady, and she was really fat. And so he said, you get started. So I went in there and started. He said, what are you going to do? I said, I'm going to cut out the uh, 11th rib. He said, no, you're cutting out the 12th rib. I said, no. I said, I'll cut out the 11th rib. And then he was watching me. He said, now, what are you cleaning out there? Which rib? I said, number 11. He started hitting me on the top of the head. You dumb freak. He said, you got to do what I'm telling you. I said, OK. So then I asked for the rib shear. He said, what rib are you cutting? I said, number 11. <laughs> he said, you dumb Greek. And then I pulled it off, and there was the adrenal gland right underneath the 11th rib. He said, I was testing you. <laughs> 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 he said, you got to have confidence in what you do. And it's interesting that in our era, when we were growing up, you had to have a lot of confidence. And not only that, but cardiac surgeons were very competitive. I remember when I had this college scholarship, and they went to visit Dr. Dietrich in Arizona with the big E of Dr. Cooley. And Dr. Dietrich, since he was at the University of Michigan, had a party for him. And that night, UCLA was playing Houston in basketball. Now, they all wanted to bet on Houston. I was the only out-of-towner. And so the only thing I could do was take bets on UCLA side. And I remember sitting next to Dr. Cooley in the den, and we would bet a dollar who's going to make the next basket. Well, anyhow, UCLA won, and I walked out of his party with $1,500. <laughs> the competition between these guys they were unbelievable. Dr. Cooley one time called me. And I was getting ready to leave to go to London. And he said, Dino, he said, there's an anencephalic baby at Evanston Hospital. He said, I want you to go there. I don't care what you do, how you do it. Just get that baby, and I'll meet you in the airport at 7 o'clock tomorrow morning in Houston. Well, I had never seen an anencephalic baby before. I didn't know what it was like. They, from their eyebrow to their ears, they had nothing of it. it was, their brain was completely gone. And so the baby was going to be used for a transplant. And so I had to make arrangements to take the plane. And I, got, I couldn't get a direct flight to Houston. And so I had to stop in Atlanta. I had an ambulance on the, on, the, on the tarmac, all heated up to about 105 degrees. Finally, I got the kid down to uh, Houston, and Dr. Cooley was there. And he was laughing. I said, what are you laughing? He says, were people asking you about New York? I said, yeah, everybody wanted to know. This, they thought this baby was going to New York, and I kept saying Houston. 
they didn't know anything about Houston. He said, I know. I said, what happened? He said, I was having dinner with Adrian Cantriplis, who was a big cardiac surgeon from New York, last night in New York with him, and he told me about this anencephalic baby. I excused myself, I got up and I called you and I knew you'd bring the baby down there. He said, we got the baby. And he's still waiting for it over there in New York. But that's the way these guys were so competitive. It was just fascinating. And so many different advances had been made and they had to have a lot of confidence in themselves. I remember Dr. Thomas Bathis, who was an unbelievable person. When I was working in the emergency room at Swedish College Hospital, there was a patient that came in in shock, and the wife told me that he had a history of a abdominal aortic aneurysm, which is a big bubble in the belly artery, the aorta. And so I didn't really know what to do. I said, well, we've got to get somebody to come down here. And so they paged Dr. Bathis. He was just leaving the hospital. He had a suit in it. And he came down, and he said, what's going on? And I said, and I'd never met him before. I said, well, the wife told me that he had a history of down the work and he was in, and he's going into shock. He says, get a scalp. So he took off his jacket, rolled up his sleeves, got a scalpel, and with his bare hands, cut open the belly. There it was filled with blood. He ran in, grabbed it with his hand, got a vascular clamp, put it down there. I said, okay, now we're going to go up and take care of this patient. So then, brought the patient up to the operating room. I had never been in an operating room before. That was the first time. And he washed it out and did everything. We finally replaced the aneurysm and fixed it. And that patient left the hospital about two weeks after the operation. It was amazing. But being with Dr. Baffis, it was amazing that every Sunday morning at 6 a.m., we go to the Skokie Animal Hospital to practice using the heart-lung machine and to try different kinds of experiments on dogs. And we were even operating on some defects in dogs just to get the experience. Well, one time, there was Dr. Kisola who worked with Dr. Baffis, who ran the heart-lung machine. Now, everything is new. He had a clamp on the arterial side, which is the, the pressure side of the heart-lung machine. So he puts the clamp on there, and all of a sudden, it exploded and blood went all over the place. He was covered with the floor, the ceiling, everything was loaded with blood. And so he said, oh, he felt terrible. He said, I'm going to go across the street and I'll get some coffee. He went across the street and at that time there was a, a hatchet killer in Spokane. He walks into this coffee <laughs> shop. He's loaded with blood and there's two policemen sitting there. <coughs> and he gets the coffee and they said, listen, how come you're all filled with blood? So well, we're doing experiments over at the dog lab over there. Okay, so we're going to go with you. So we went over there. <laughs> Dr. Baffis was so upset. They opened the door and they asked Dr. Baffis, do you know this guy? He said, I never saw him before. <laughs> <laughs> but he explained it. But that's the way these guys were. He had a heart lung machine in his station wagon because they were so expensive. The hospitals couldn't buy it. So he bought the heart lung machine and he would go from hospital to hospital to hospital and perform different kinds of operative procedures on the patients. And then he started operating on a lot of patients from the AHEPA that they were sending their little children over for heart operations because he was at the Children's Hospital also with Dr. Potts of Northwestern. And there were a lot of congenital defects at the time. And he really had his heart and soul buried into the kind of work that he was doing. These guys were absolutely phenomenal. And it, it continued on because you saw the way these people were. And always trying to make something a little bit better. And there's a fellow right here, Dr. Dietrich, who really took and changed almost the entire practice of vascular surgery instead of doing a big operation and fixing an artery from the outside, he developed a technique to fix the artery from inside. And again, I had a, a very unusual experience. 
my son-in-law is the chief of radiology at Lutheran General, and he said, Pops, he said, uh, you know, you haven't had a CT scan or had any checkups, why don't you get a CT scan? So I got a CT scan, and I saw they put some dye in there, and it was leaking into the right iliac artery. So I called Dr. Dieter from Arizona. I said, Ted, I said, I got leaking in. This is on a Friday night. He said, uh, send the disc to me on the next flight to Arizona. So I sent the next, I went to the airport, and the thing that really bothered me, I had to pay a full fare for the little disc. <laughs> <laughs> but I got it there, Ted saw it. He called me back, he said, we're going to do you as an emergency tomorrow because it's rupturing. He says, you got to come as soon as you can. Well, I couldn't get there Saturday in the morning. I got there late Saturday night. So he said, okay, we'll do it Sunday morning. So it's 6 o'clock Sunday morning. He had everything all set, went down, fixed my aneurysm. And then that night we went out and had dinner. And then we went and came back to Chicago on Tuesday after that. It was amazing. But that's the way most of the doctors at that time were. They were very confident. <coughs> they felt very comfortable in what they were doing. And they did it. And that's we see a lot of progress that has been made. It's just unbelievable. The other interesting thing was when I went to London, there was a guy by the name of Lister. I think you heard of Listerine. Well, Lister developed the antiseptic technique. And in London, they used to have, just to keep the germs away, in the corners, they would have little sprays that would spray carbolic anhydrase into the operating room. There was a little drain underneath the operating table so that all of this could go there and drain down. But you couldn't wear regular shoes in the operating room. So Lister developed the Lister boots, which was a boot. It was like a go-go boot. It was like a white boot with a black strap on the back. And you had to wear the Lister boots to go in there. And when I finally got to London, I was told that I had to learn their techniques. It would take at least three months for me to learn their techniques. I said, OK. So it just happened that very next weekend, I was on call. And the national health system at that time worked that all the congenital heart disease children were transferred to the children's hospital at Great Ormond Street for care. So it was about 1 o'clock in the morning. They sent a little kid that was a blue baby and needed to have a, a Waterston shunt, which was developed by Mr. Waterston, who was head over there. And I called him up and I said, Mr. Waterston, <coughs> we, uh, you have to do your operation on this little baby. He said, okay. He said, I'll see you in the operating room. Now, this was the very first weekend that was on call. He came slushing into the operating room. I looked over the ether screen. He said, do you know what you're doing? I said, yes. He said, carry on. <laughs> <laughs> but he was just an unbelievable guy. I remember one time we went to a dinner at his house with his wife. and. Uh, she had a turkey, and she dropped the turkey onto the floor. And her only comment was, too bad the bird couldn't fly. Amazing kinds of things that went on. And they had a hierarchy. You could not talk to a nurse. You had to talk to the sister, who was the head nurse. Now, I did an operation. Here's this nurse that's been with the baby for 12 hours I come in to make rounds in the morning and I said to the nurse how's the baby doing just a minute I'll get sister I said wait you've been here for 12 hours why don't you just tell me no real here you have to stop the this kid is doing no I'll get sister so you had to get sister and talk to sister and then she was the one that had to tell you what was going on just amazing how they the hierarchy even when they brought Prince Charles over there. He had an inflamed appendix, and they wanted the best surgeon in the hospital to operate on Prince Charles. Well, they said clear the seventh floor, which is the private ward. Well, they couldn't do that. They could only clear a portion of it. So they cleared this thing, and now the royal physicians and surgeons were gathering 
in the boardroom of the hospital, deciding what they were going to do with the patient, the prince. I called him Charlie. He didn't like that. <laughs> <laughs> then what happened was is that uh, Waterson came by, touched his bill. He said, this guy's got a cute appendicitis. Now, in the national health system, you don't need consents. So once you're admitted, the doctors take over. So he, there was no consent necessary. So he went in, brought him to the operating room. 20 minutes later, the operation was over. Charlie was back in his room. And now the operation was over, and they were deciding what to do. And they heard that he had operated on him already. And he didn't really like the royalty that much. So on the back of an envelope, he sent a note down to the queen. The Prince of Wales had an inflamed appendix, and I shall see him tomorrow morning at 9 a.m. And sent a note to the Queen. So as a result of that, he never became a Sir. He only became a MBE, a master of the, the member of the British Empire. And then from then on, it's really interesting. Can we start some of these slides? Oh, I can do that. The interesting thing is, is that most of the early slide, most of the early operations were really performed on children. And rheumatic heart disease was a terrible situation. Most of the patients that had rheumatic heart disease died. And as a result, it was really a lethal kind of a thing. They tried to do everything. Now, they finally started using a way to get to the heart by sawing the breastbone. And the interesting thing is, today we have these fancy saws that you just zip up right down the stern and open up the chest. But when I started, we had the Lipschitz knife. Remember that, that big knife that you had with a big mallet, and you had to knock this thing, and you had to open up the stern with this knife. And now things have advanced so quickly, it's amazing. Now we have robotics. And the interesting thing is, is that there are not very many big incisions made anymore. They're small incisions. But my son does a lot of the robotics surgery, but they're not doing it anymore because it takes too long to set up all of that equipment. You've got to set up the equipment in the operating table. You've got to have the consoles. You've got to have everything. So by the time they're ready to do the operation, if you did it the standard way, you'd be done. That's a, all the different improvements in technique. And there's a robotic operating room where you see everybody looking at the TV monitors and seeing how things were done at that time. Now, you started with these prosthetic heart valves, the artificial heart valve. And there are different types of artificial heart valves. And when I was at the Heart Institute at the National Institutes of Health in Maryland, we were doing studies on different types of heart valves. And I developed a technique to operate on calves who were like 150 pounds that would grow big so we see what the effect of growth was on the annulus of the valve. And then we tried different kinds of anticoagulants. Now these, these calves were all brain fed. So now, the boss of the heart institute told me, he said, Dino, I don't care how you do it, get me the liver. <laughs> so I got him the liver. I became the biggest meat supplier to the NIH. I was a master every time we sacrificed the cow. And I really ruined it because I told the vet at the NIH farm, I said, you know, we ought to do something. He said, I said, well, I watch how these calves get up and they always get up on the right side. He said, so what? I said, that means the full legs on the left side are more tender than the right side. And then he said, that's it. Next time we sacrifice the calf, we must have had 10 different agencies you know, watching us to make sure that we didn't take any. <laughs> With the robotic surgery, instead of making that big incision down the middle of the chest, you make a little incision right underneath the arm and you put in the various ports to be able to perform the procedure. And these are the various types of heart valves. Those are carbonite, the ones on the upper left. Those are different types of heart valves. 
And one on the left lower there is a tissue valve, that's a pig valve, the aortic valve, and the other one is the uh, pericardial valve. And those are the different types of prostheses that you can put in to replace the diseased valves of the heart, either the aorta or the mitral position. And there, now you're starting to see the development of what Dr. Dietrich started a long time ago, being able to do it from inside the blood vessel. The port. The key feature of the PHP is its expandable covered nitinol cannula with integrated impeller. The cannula is positioned across the aortic valve and the impeller spins to move four to five liters of blood per minute through the cannula from the left ventricle into the ascending aorta. It's then inserted over a guide wire into the femoral artery via a 13 French introducer sheath and advanced over the aortic arch so that the distal end of the device is positioned across the aortic valve. The PHP catheter is positioned properly of the aortic valve. Once properly positioned, the outer sheath of the PHP is retracted, allowing the covered self-expanding night nodular begins to spin. Blood is pulled into the cannula from the left ventricle and deposited into the ascending aorta. Those are the various types of intravascular prostheses that are used for different kinds of anomalies or abnormalities. There's one for a aneurysm of the, of the chest, of the artery of the chest. And that could be done by percutaneous techniques. This is when you do a bypass operation, they harvest the uh, vein from the leg and they use the, the scopes to do that as well. And you can look down inside and see what you're harvesting with the scopes. Now this is something I want Alex to talk about too. Where is Alex? Where is Alex? This was the operating room when I went to Cook County Hospital. That was 1969. There were no screens on the windows. There were no boxes for the x-rays. And you had to take the x-rays <laughs> on the window to see what you were looking And there were no screens, but it got hot in the operating room, so we had to open the windows. And you open the windows, and you had birds flying into the operating room. <laughs> <laughs> but it's really changed. Now, this is an endovascular suit. This is something that's developed <clears throat> since the admin of the popularity that Ted developed, that you have the insertion of various devices percutaneously. So what you can do it with a little incision in the grind. And if you look at what our operating rooms are like today, look at this. It's unbelievable to have all these monitors, all these different kinds of uh, techniques that are used to watch what's happening to the patient. And today, having a heart operation has a smaller, lower mortality than having your ball bladder operator. It's unbelievable. It's such a safe procedure because you're watching everything that's being done. And this is now the next generation of what's happening. These are the artificial heart assist devices that are utilized. You put one area of that pump that's in there and to absorb the blood from the body and the other one to pump it into the body through the aorta or the ventricle. And it's amazing, these people, there you see it. You see the pump on the bottom. You see the, the bypass of the pump with the sucking the blood from the one artery and pumping it out of the other. And they have a battery. You see the different batteries underneath the arms? These guys have to wear battery packs. And I remember about a year ago, my son Tony had a party, a dinner party, for 90 people that had these artificial hearts to play with. They play golf, they do everything. It's just unbelievable what they do. That's another form of an implantable heart. heart. These are different variations of being able to collect the blood from the return of the body and pumping it out oxygenated into the body. And that's putting one in, you just make a little incision. It's a lot 
smaller than making a big incision with that saw in the chest. And there we see the different types of prosthesis and left heart assist devices they're called. They have different types, different kinds of things. They're all offshoots of the same kind of thing, but it's amazing. This is a bridge to transplantation. In other words, somebody needs an artificial heart, they can have this implanted, I mean a, a heart transplant. They can have this artificial bypass used to carry them over to the point where they get a donor to be able to do a transplanted heart. A lot of technologies involved in this. It's amazing. And there's the heart made. It's one of the valves that goes inside percutaneously. It's amazing that the morbidity and mortality of all these procedures continues to fall. And at the end, this is what Abe Lincoln said, long time ago. Many, many years together, and we did a lot of 
things that really save people. I mean, one time I remember doing a bypass operation in the cardiac cath lab that he wanted me to do. I mean, we've done a lot of things together. It's amazing. Lemby? I put the book inside. <laughs> <laughs> You know, teams, <coughs> Tino, Tatulis, and I followed a, a path that could lead us to a, a mission. These paths kept crisscrossing. Criss we graduated from medical school the same, at the same time. He from Loyola, I from the University of Chicago. Then I left the University of Chicago to go to Philadelphia. Dino came to the University of Chicago. From Philadelphia, I went to the University of Iowa. From Iowa, I went to New Jersey, then back to the University of Chicago. When I came back, Dino left to go to the NIH. When he came back from the NIH, I left to go to Northwestern. <laughs> we kept crisscrossing. Then, eventually, our paths merged. We came together. We have both embarked on a mission. We were focused on that mission. We shared ideals, commitments, and dedications. We understood each other, and we got together. We discussed things. He would listen to me, and I would listen to him, and there would come to conclusions an ideal relationship. We did a lot of things that were not being done before because we communicated, because we understood each other. Of course, I have a cardiologist, he was a surgeon, he'd operate on the patients. He'd see them once or twice after the operation. And I would follow them for years, for decades. Earlier today, I called a man in Greece who 25 years ago had four bypasses. He's now 89 years old. He sounded wonderful. <coughs> a few days ago, I talked to the son of another patient that was operated down here from Greece 30 years ago. He's now 94 years old, and he's doing very well. And I can go on and on and on. There was, there we, had, we had some challenges, we had some difficulties. There was one man who was taken to a lecture brothers hospital late one night, and Dr. Tatulis happened to be there visiting a friend, and he called me, I was at St. Francis. There was a man here who was blood pressure 60, he has had multiple cardioversions with shocks to the heart was stopping. What can I do is that try this medication, then get an ambulance, get him here. I'll have everything all set up so you can put a balloon pump in. And he did. And put the balloon pump in. Thank you. And then he stabilized, the man stabilized. We knew then from other people's experiences that if you took the balloon pump out, chances are 90, 95% they would die. So I decided, and I had the support, before taking the balloon pump out, I went to a cardiac characterization to find out what the, coronary, what the function of the heart is, what the coronary arteries look like. And after we did that, we decided we cannot take the balloon pump out. It takes about four weeks before there is a clear-cut delineation between the healthy and the damaged part of the heart. The damaged part of the heart was ballooning out. We have to remove that. We kept it in. And Dr. Tatulis operated on this man. We removed that balloon part out and four by three bypasses. And then went home 
tragically, he was killed by a drunk driver who crossed him three years or three years later. So we, then we reasoned also that uh, the mortality rate in people that were operated on that had extensive coronary artery disease would, would die after the operation. And the question was, why? We restored the normal blood flow to the, to the heart and still they died. <laughs> And I have a thought that I shared with uh, Dr. Bennett at Healy, who was at uh, the NIH at the time, that maybe the part of the heart was used to what we call anaerobic metabolism, work without the oxygen. Then suddenly we flooded with oxygen and didn't have a chance to reach us. So if we put a balloon back in, for three or four days in advance, maybe we'll give it a chance to readjust. And we started doing that. We lost patient 87. Because uh, I was away at the time, and unfortunately, uh, an an arrhythmia was not appreciated. <coughs> but it worked. And we did a lot of these things. And I have patients, not anymore, but I stay in touch with some of them, who have lived 40, 45 years since the operations. I have one man who had aortic valve replacement on four bypasses <coughs> in 1977, and is still healthy. He's doing very well. A lady that had three valves replaced 29 years ago. She's wonderful. And I can go on and on. I have a list of patients, but I, I can tell you one dramatic example. Late one night, about 10 o'clock, I got a call. I picked up the phone, no answer. I resumed having my dinner. Ten minutes later, it rings again. Still no answer. Ten minutes later, it rings again. So, who is this? Maybe it's an emergency. And through sobs, I heard, please, please don't hang up. Please don't hang up. Our little angel, three years old, has a complex congenital heart problem. And they told us here in Greece, and in Switzerland, and in France, and in England, that nothing can be done. I was going to Greece for Easter. I said, give me a telephone number, I'll call you. We bring the little girl and all the information that you have. So he did. Three years old, blind girl, totally blue, blue circles around the eyes, blue, blue lobes, tip of the nose, blue fingernails. And I brought all the information I had. I called Dino, he was in Cook County at the time, at the University of Illinois, we got together. We didn't help her. He brought the little girl here. She had, in effect, one heart chamber. We called her the body of cushion defect. And I got to do this operator on her. And here she is. She has a master's in economics. That's in 1976. She was three years old. Now it's, it's 19, 2015. Every time I go to Greece, I go see her. And I have to summon my reserves every time when I take it in my arms to not squeeze it too hard. It's hard. And I have a lot of examples like this. Compile this, another example, and I'll stop with that. And then he was 38 years old, was operated on 
four bypasses. The next year, he ran the Boston Marathon. And he was running the Boston Marathon for many years. He passed away three years ago at the age of 83. started the Arizona Heart Institute in 1972. I went to visit him and, and my children. We went to go horseback riding. And we went to a place and got some horses and I asked the guy, I said, where's the private path? And he looked at me, private path? He said, there's over 100,000 acres back there. Go <laughs> <laughs> But anyhow, it's really my pleasure to have you come all the way from Phoenix to come here and tell us a little well, you know, thank you so much for um, inviting me. Um, I've been in tears the last 15 minutes listening to all these uh, stories, uh, the wonderful stories. Um, and what they are really is a tribute to you, Dino, and your wonderful colleagues here and what you've been able to uh, do. I didn't know that your son was in Monte Carlo uh, giving a talk about heart lung transplant. Um, I would have told you that uh, I did the first heart lung transplant in Arizona. Uh, that lady uh, is still alive. Uh, she's 28 years following that. They said she would never live. She got her master's in education. Uh, and I, in writing the book I'm writing, I called her to see how she was doing. So we all have these uh, really great stories. The thing that makes it special to me uh, is the, more than uh, just the stories of our patients. Uh, it's the relationship that um, Dr. Tatulis and I uh, have had over all of these years. So we've been able to exchange these ideas of how we might do things better, uh, talk about the stories of our successes, and equally folks, the stories of our failures because not every not everything we've done uh, turns out to be a perfect uh, ending. But you must wonder why to label this book the Heartbeats. <laughs> Those are the heartbeats. And that band you saw on the cover there uh, is the band that we put together in Houston, or in Houston uh, uh, Texas, uh, while I was with uh, Dr. Cooley and Dr. DeBakey. And uh, when Dina was writing his book, I think he was getting near the end, uh, he called me and said, well, Ted, uh, can you get me some information about the heartbeats? And so we sent this album to him, and he, uh, <laughs> then, then he uh, uh, made the heartbeats the, the, title, I guess you probably did that. Uh, so I couldn't help but uh, have our people in the audiovisual put that together. And uh, I'm going to come back to that. Uh, I will tell you, I have a, a disclaimer to tell you. You know, in medicine now, when we get a talk, we have to stand up and say we have a disclaimer, which means we don't get any money from any company anywhere around the world, which is all a lie. But anyway, <laughs> the, facts, the facts are I do have a disclaimer because I've known about this book for some period of time, and I told Dino I was also writing my own book. And so when I read Dino's for the third time, I find that we have some parallel stories. Uh, so my disclaimer is I'll try not to repeat any of the stories, but I may have some ideas I want to talk to you about. The first is this. He has a chapter, A Gift of a Lifetime. This is really very important because Dr. Freddie Collar was professor of, of surgery at the University of Michigan. He also is the founder of the American College of Surgeons uh, with a colleague from here in, in Chicago. Uh, and he developed a, a tour uh, where people could uh, be selected for residency around the world. Uh, and this is the fourth clinical meeting of the Collar Society. Uh, and they, from this, they selected some of these uh, papers. 
Craig Collar became a really close and very important friend of mine. Uh, I went through the residency program there, and then he actually retired and came to St. Joe Hospital. Well, I didn't realize until the airplane yesterday, you know, that you used this word serendipity in your book. I guess I missed that the first time around. Because this is the cover of my book. It's called SLED, The Serendipitous Ride of Edward Dietrich. <laughs> now, I can't tell you why I named it SLED, but I can tell you how to buy the book in August. <laughs> <laughs> so what is serendipity? It's an aptitude for making desirable discoveries by accident. And Dino, you and I and your colleagues certainly know that this is the case. We've all witnessed serendipity over and over again in our, in our lives. And this is probably one of the most important serendipitous stories I can possibly tell about my closest friend, Dino. I had the opportunity to operate on an executive of Lowe's Corporation. Uh, it was a desperate case. A patient came from New York City. New York surgeons wouldn't operate on me. I mean, he was, he was gonna die. Um, but anyway, uh, we operated. Uh, Dino happened to be in town. He, he talks about this in the book. And we had a successful result. And the brother of the patient that we operated on called me and he said, Ted, we're so grateful. He's back in New York, he's doing just fine. And I want to invite you and your, your young friend, uh, Dr. Tullis, uh, to come to uh, Nice, France to Monte Carlo because we were opening a new hotel there. Well, I called Dino, I said, Dino, we can't miss this, miss this because they're gonna take us on the, on the uh, Concorde. And so we fly in the Concorde to, uh, to uh, Monte Carlo. Well, we were a little younger then, more adventurous and, and much less uh, careful. So I uh, talked to the fellow who was the general manager. I said, well, Dr. Tudis and I want to write some motorcycles because we want to tour around the hills, around the country, and so forth. So they arranged that. And uh, one morning, oh, at that time I was sort of interested in sailing, so I wanted to go to, uh, to Nice, which is only 30 minutes away. So we were ready to go, and it was raining. And so Dean and I decided, well, maybe we can't go. If it's raining, maybe we should. We made a decision to go even in the rain. So we get into Nice, and because of the rain, we were delayed, uh, and the, the uh, store was closed where they sell the boating parts. And so we said, well, let's go have beer. That seemed like a good solution if you couldn't buy the sales. And so we sat down at the local bar there, uh, and as we're sitting there, we hear this, and Dino tells the story, we hear this uh, lady dragging her child across the, the street screaming and yelling, my child is dying, my uh, child is dying. And we look and you know, lo and behold, he, she's dragging into the apothecary shop. So I said, Dino, get down our bikes, we've got to go in here and see what's going on. Well, we go in and fortunately we had a good result. This is the article in the newspaper that occurred the next day. According to the pharmacist, the child appeared lifeless, no motion or breathing. The men in the white jackets went immediately into action, placing the child on the counter and initiating cardiopulmonary resuscitation. They obviously knew what they were doing and had been trained somewhere. They did not speak French, but spoke to each other in English. I called for an ambulance. After a short period, which seemed like hours, I could see the lifeless body because it had some color. I heard one fellow say to his partner, keep it up, keep it up, I feel a pulse. We got him back. The boy began to breathe and started to move his arms. By the time this, this time, my shop was quite crowded with onlookers. The ambulance arrived and I began explaining the entire episode to the attendants. When I later turned around to thank the white jacketed fellows, they were nowhere to be seen. A lady at the front desk confirmed that the gentleman had left the shop, climbed on the motorbikes, and went down the street. <laughs> shaking his head. He said, uh, these are the headlines in the Monte Carlo news today. He said, you, would you fellows have any idea of what this is all about? Who were the 
the white angels on Cyprus that saved the little child's life. <laughs> why we believe in serendipity. Um, this is my bike. Uh, I, I did do some motorcycle riding after that, he and I did together, but my son decided that I, since I like the motorcycles, he should develop a hard bike. And so this is the hard bike. It, it's wonderful. It's got all kinds of, everything about it is, ha, has something to do with heart surgery. And we, we just dedicated this to the Museum of Science uh, Air Tunnel. Now, in my book, uh, I talk about uh, medicine and music and sports because those have been the three triads of, of my life. But I want to tell you how important something as simple as the heartbeats can, can be. Uh, in fact, I say here it leads to a mobile organ transplantation. We had not done a heart transplant on the banking service at that time. Dr. Cooley had done seven hearts the weekend before. And I was very interested in, in moving ahead uh, our program. But I also knew in some time in the future, we were not going to have enough organs. And we all appreciate that now. So for several months, with my colleague John Litico, a uh, resident, we would work at my house at night, big board, and would sketch out a scheme that would allow us to take a, a heart, the lungs, two kidneys, and two corneas from a patient, from a donor and transplant all of these simultaneously in four operating rooms. It was a, a massive, massive thing to do. But we had it down to every telephone number, every person we might have to call. Well, we didn't have a donor come. And then the heartbeats went down and played at St. Joe Hospital for a charity. And afterwards, we were over at the bar having a glass of wine. And some pretty little nurse was next to, to me. And I said, well, I'm Dr. Dietrich. I'm from transplant team at Methodist Hospital. She says, well, I'm in the intensive care unit. I said, well, if you have any opportunity to look for a donor, find a donor, just give me a call because we're trying to do our first heart transplant. Well, a couple days later, I was coming home from the football field where I take my son to practice, and I, I uh, got home. I was about to, to, to have some dinner. I turned the TV on, uh, and before I could do that, the phone rang, and the person said, uh, this is uh, St. Joe Hospital. And I knew immediately it had to be that nurse that had the, the donor for us. So I quickly went to the hospital, changed my clothes, and uh, Dino and I, uh, I mean, uh, John and I, uh, went down to the uh, St. Joe's. I walked in the intensive care unit and it was totally empty. There wasn't anybody around me except this nurse. And this wasn't the pretty young nurse before, so I was a nurse. <laughs> and so anyway, I, I pulled back the, the drapes and I examined this lady, and she was neurologically dead. So I came out and I said to the nurse, I said, well, where is the husband? And she says, the husband is in jail. And I said, how could, how could, I, why would he be in jail? They think he shot his wife. So I look at John, I said, John, we have the husband in jail. We don't have a permit. What are we going to do? We didn't even talk to each other. We jumped in the car and went to the sheriff's department. We go to the sheriff's department. We have our long white coats on. And I said, the sheriff, I'm Dr. Dietrich. I introduced myself. And I said, I understand you have Mr. Hernandez here. He says, yes, he's uh, back in the cell. I said, uh, why do you have him? He shot his wife. I said, well, sheriff, would it be OK if I just talked to him? I just like to talk to him a little bit. He said, it's fine, Dr. Dietrich, it's fine. So he lets me in the cell, close, cell, close the door, locks me in <coughs> with Mr. Hernandez. And so I sit down beside him, and I said, I'm from the transplant team. I have to tell you, your wife is brain dead. And that's the terrible news. But the good news is we can take some organs and we can save her life. And I would like to ask you for their permission. But I said, I have to ask you one thing first. Did you shoot your wife? He broke down in tears. He was crying. I put my arms around him. I said, I know it's the worst time for you, but this is an opportunity for you to save your, your life's organs in, in other patients. And he says, I'll sign the form. So I rattled on the cage, and the sheriff came, and I said, Sheriff, um, I need to take Mr. Hernandez to the hospital 
to sign the forms. And I said, by the way, Sheriff, he didn't kill his wife. No, he didn't kill his wife. He was very, very badly about this. He says, on your word, I'll let you take Mr. Hernandez to the hospital. So we did. I put Mr. Hernandez in the back seat with John. And John was in perspiration for the six, next six blocks. <laughs> Here he had a killer right next to him. We get to the, we get to the um, hospital, and before that there was one person was the ugly nurse. Now there are 50 people around there. Now, I said, John, um, we, you get the permit sign. Get the permit sign. And I said, we're all set to go except one thing. Remember, I'm Dr. DeBakey's associate at that time. And I hadn't told Dr. DeBakey anything about the multiple transplantation. It was a total secret with all the surgeons and everybody except the head nurse. So I called the head nurse and I said, her name was Dana. I said, Dana, it's a go. Activate the, the, the chart. One phone call activated five operating rooms, all the team that they needed and including the audiovisual department, I wanted to document this first time in the world. So John and I get in the car, go back to Methodist Hospital. By this time, um, we had the EEG guy there, so he could check the, the brain and so forth. And I go back, and he says, uh, yes, this is, he's going to be a good donor. I go to all the operating rooms to see if the teams are working. I said, it's time I called Dr. Bacon. So I called Dr. Bacon. I said, Dr. Bacon, I've got wonderful news. We have a donor. For Mr. Carroll, who was a patient from Phoenix, had been sent to me for a heart transplant. And he said, wonderful, Ted, wonderful. I said, we have even better news. We're going to be able to do a, do a lung transplant, two kidneys transplants, and we're taking the coronary. Ted, you've lost your mind. <laughs> we can't possibly do this. Hung the phone up. Now, here I am. You know, I've got five operations. The whole hospital is geared up with this. So I walk around, check it again. I go back, Dr. Biggie, I check everything out. It's fine. It's your goal. He says, we don't have blood for this. I thought, geez, man, we don't have nothing. <laughs> so I go to the blood bank, I go to the blood bank. The blood people said, you got all the blood you need for all these operations. So I go around one more time. It was like probably 30 seconds. It seemed like 30 minutes every time I made that round. I called Dr. Biggie at home. I said, Dr. Vicky, we have all operating rooms going. We have all the blood we need for this. You must come now. You must come down right away. He hung up. And I thought, uh oh, what have I done to myself? Should I, have I really gone over the boundaries at this time? About five minutes later, he comes walking down this corridor. You can hear his keys. He always had these keys right on letting you know he's on his way. He comes and he says, well, where's the donor? I said, the donor's back in the ICU. Let me take you back there. So I took him back. He went behind the curtain. I stayed about 10 feet away because I didn't know what was going to happen. <laughs> so he comes busting through the curtains and starts running down by the x-ray department. And I was about two feet behind him all the way. I didn't know what I was going to do. I thought, I, I know my whole life is gone. I've spent all these years. This man is going to kick me out of the residency. I'll never be able to do all the things I wanted to do. I was desperate. So I just took him by the elbow and I nudged him in to the black x-ray room where it was hardly any light. And I took him by the elbow and I said, Dr. B, can I just ask you one thing? Do you think that Dr. Cooley would ever pass up on this opportunity of a lifetime? <laughs> he fell for about three seconds. He looked at me in the eye and said, Ted, you're right. Proceed. <laughs> <laughs> so, without the heartbeats, it would have never happened. You know, so. um, this just shows what the multiple organ transplantation looked like the next uh, day. Um, the only sad about the story, part of the story was that um, Dr. DeBiggy hadn't known any of the planning. Uh, he had participated in any planning. Uh, he didn't know until I made the phone call we were going to do it. But the next day, when they had the press release and the conference, Dr. Baker was right up on the stage taking all the credits. <laughs> 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 um, I uh, did the first live uh, uh, television of open heart surgery. Uh, and I was 
lucky to participate in the first live of an end of the grad uh, for an aneurysm. But that couldn't have happened without my buddy here. Uh, we had the patient in the, opera, in the hospital, uh, and I called Tina and I said, uh, uh, I mean, we had several patients in the hospital, and none were, the, were very good for this. So I said, Dino, do you have a patient that we could put the end of the little graft in? And he says, yes, I have a patient. I think it's a good case. So she, he brought the patient down. Here in the middle is the patient that after the day after surgery. Dino's on the right of the back, I'm in the middle. Juan Prodi, the one who developed this technique, came out from Argentina, and Claudio Schoenholz, his partner, was also involved. And so that was the first live case of an endoluma graft. Patient originates in Chicago, Dino comes down and assists me with the case. <laughs> you can see we have a long, long relationship. Dino, this is a tribute to you. I labeled this talk, Bonds That Can't Be Broken. That's what I feel about our friendship. starting tomorrow to even <laughs> so it's inspiring and in that uh, in a way that I think I'll probably never take a doctor for granted again you know we we come we go to a doctor and we just see the surface of it and, and you obviously have done amazing things and you're pioneers in, in many ways um, I just want to tell everyone that the book the um, small book, you don't have to spend a lot of time reading it, it's fun, as you can tell from the presentation. It's on sale at the, right outside of the, our, our store, and uh, Dr. Tatulis will be available for signing it, and maybe after August, when your book comes out, we'll be happy to present it here as well. Yeah, that'd be great. Yeah. Just put a little extra green stuff in there, so. Uh, but in terms of the 
mention of this museum? Uh, it, it's like because when they turn on the, off the mic, so you can't go on talking. Uh, in terms of this museum, this is precisely you know the, the stories we have an exhibition on the third floor which tells of the Greek immigration story, which is the universal story. So all of us have come from somewhere else, and all of us um, from different ethnicities, cultural uh, heritages, etc., have made this country what it is, and that country has also provided these opportunities to be able to do amazing things like you've been doing. So we uh, thank you very much, and um, you will be memorialized here in the, in the museum somehow. Thank you very much. One of the unique things about this little book. Yeah. Okay. One of the the unique things about this little book is that it's just not stories, but it's illustrations. And the most important person that we have in the room here that hasn't been introduced yet, would you please stand up, Tommy? And just, just as, a, as an aside, with, with the heartbeats and how important they were, there was a. This is in the book, and I think that it would be interesting for you to, to get the facts about it when you read it. But just a real fast aside: when they came to Chicago, the unions, the Petrillo Union, was very, very strong, and they were going to perform at one of the conventions. Well, they were told that they couldn't perform because they were not union. And so consequently, all of the men and all their instruments and all the anticipations were down the drain. Dino heard this, stepped aside a little bit, made a phone call. And now my cousin Mary is here, her uncle Nick just happened to be the president of the Chicago Musicians Union. <laughs> Dino made a call, and the thing that happens in Chicago is not, it's not what you know, but who you know. Nick made a few calls, came over, the heartbeats played at the convention. So, so once again, I, I thank you very much. Uh, I'm, I'm really happy that I was able to put this book together. It's just family stories, but they're a lot of fun, and I think that you'll probably enjoy reading them also. So thank you all for coming here, and I hope you have a very wonderful afternoon.